Today's shir begins at the top line of Daf Tzadi. You will notice that we have triangles that appear. Actually, several of them on the first line. We're beginning with the end of the line, the inverted triangle Toshma. And this is essentially a continuation of the topic that we began during our last year, where we saw Rabba express his uh, amazement at Rav Chisto's interpretation of the issue concerning Hafrosha's Truma Tamea on Torah, where Rav Chista had said that if one intentionally did so, was tithed from Tome to exempt Tor, the uh, Truma is nothing. Nothing has been, uh, the, has been accomplished. And Rabbo raised the problem that on a Torah level, it is considered an effective tithing. How could it be then that the rabbis would come along and declare it because of Gzera Shema Yifsha, because of the fear that the owner might not tithe again as he is expected to. So the rabbi said that what you declared as, as a tithe is nothing. How can that be when the Torah says it is a tithe? And in other terms, using the rabbinic style, how is it that there is a... There, where in the world do you come off with this idea that the Yeshkech L'chachomim L'akor Dover Min Torah? Where do the Chachomim come off having the right to uproot something that was intended by the Torah? And that was Rabbo's attack, if you will, on Rav Chista. Rav Chista turned the tables and says to Rabbo, what are you amazed at? There are many sources where you see this happening. And now we continue with another one of those sources. The, in, and do, of course, look at our uh, at the previous uh, doc, doc pay test to see where we explain the markings. But uh, in the interest of those who are not first-time listeners, we continue now. Toshma. Uh, Ocha, and I do note, by the way, this is a very long point. In other words, uh, uh, Rav Chista is going to be spending more than half of this Omid in making the point. Toshma, Ochal Truma Temea, Mishalem Chulin Tahorim. If a uh, person ate unintentionally, Truma Temea, defiled Truma, he is to repay with Chulin Tahorim, with Chulin that is pure, that's undefiled. And um, we take a look at the Rashi at the top line. Mishayim chulim Torim dechtiv v'nasan l'kohen es hakodesh. When a uh, czar, a non kohen, eats from truma wrongfully, he's not allowed to eat from truma. He's supposed to compensate. Uh, truma, of course, is the tithe given from one's produce to kohenim. <coughs> so he's supposed to compensate the kohen for that which uh, was wrongfully consumed. And he gives the post success. He gives the kain as a kodesh, and we interpret that to mean dovah haroyli as kodesh, something that is fit to become sanctified. The parak kol That's this, that's mentioned in Maseches Psachim in the second parak. We continue in the Gemara. Shilem chulim tameim. Let us say the Yisrael paid not with chulim tahorim, but with defiled chulim. Sumchus Omer, Mishum Rebbe Meir, Beshogeg Tashlumov Tashlumin, Bemezid Ein Tashlumov Tashlumin. If done unintentionally, so it's considered a compensation. If he does so intentionally, it's considered a non compensation. It's a knas. We levy a fine upon him by requiring him, uh, by declaring that which he paid as a non payment. The Chachomim say, Echod Zeh Ve'echod Zeh, Tashlumov Tashlumin. Whether he pay with Chulin Tahorim, or he pay with Chulin, uh, well, let's uh, repeat that. The Chachomim say, whether it's Shogeg or Mezid, the Tashlumim are considered Tashlumin. The Chozer Umeshalem Chulin Tahorim. Let us. Um, correct ourselves, we have a slight error here the Chacham say whether he pays with Chulim Tehorin or he pays with Chulim Temeim it's a good Tashlumen but if he paid with the Chulim Temeim he has to pay back with Chulim Tehorin Vehavinon Ba and we ask Bemezid Ein 
Tashlumov Tashlumen. You said in the source that if a person ate Truma Tamea and he paid back with Chulun Tameim, it's not considered a good compensation. So we ask in wonderment, why should it not be a good compensation? Tavolov Brocha? He deserves a blessing for that. The Ochal Minei Midi Delo Kochazile be made to Masai. The Yisrael ate Truma Tamea. That's something that's not fit to the Kohen, even when the Kohen himself is Tomei. Truma Tamea must be burnt, it cannot be eaten. So the the wrong that had been done was the consumption on the on the part of the Israel of Truma Tamea. And then what does he pay back? And he pays back Chulin Tameim. Chulin is mundane produce. Though it happens to be defiled, <coughs> if the Kohen himself it has experienced defilement, he may have touched <coughs> dead sherets, he may have become Tomei through other reasons, he may have, um, uh, have had a, uh, a certain types of, of um, uh, male uh, sightings, uh, discharges that make him Tomei. When he's Tomei, so he can't eat Truma, what can he eat? He can eat Hulin that's Tomei. So what has happened here is actually uh, seeming, seemingly a very fine form of compensation. The you see, the uh, the eating initial eating of the truma was the, was truma tamea. That's not something fit to the kain. The kain cannot even eat from that, and he received this compensation chulin tamea, something he can eat from when he's tamei. The Omar Rava, the Amri La Kedi Rava answers. Rava explains. Some say Kedi Kedi without any names. Chisuri mechaser v'hachi katani. We have to go over the source again with added information. Ochal truma tamea. If truma tamea was eaten mishalim koldu, then whatever is used to pay back, that's fine. Ochal truma tahora. If the Yisrael ate truma tahora, which he was not entitled to, mishalim chulin tahorin. He compensates with chulin. That's tahor. Shilem chulin tamea. If he paid back with chulin, that's tamei. Sumchus Omer Mishum Rebbe Meir. Sumchus quoting Rebbe Meir says, Sumchus is a name, name of a famous scholar. Sumchus says in the name of Rebbe Meir, Beshogeg Tashlumo of Tashlumen, Bemezid Ein Tashlumo of Tashlumen. If he paid back with the Chulin Tameim, which he really shouldn't have done, but he did so unwittingly, it's okay. To, it's a, uh, a good compensation. If, however, he did so intentionally, so it's not considered a compensation. Whether intentional or not, or whether not intentional or intentional, Tashlum of Tashlumen, it's a good compensation. This compensation of Chulin Tameyan. And he has to recompensate with a payment of Chulin that's Tahor. Now we're focusing, let's focus on Rebbe Meir. He was quoted by Sumchus. And we saw in under Rebbe Meir's name that if Hulin Tameim was used to pay back for the consumption of the Truma Tahora, and the Hulin Tameim was done was paid intentionally, so he said Ein Tashlum of Tashlumen Vehahacha. In this case, Demidoraiso Tashlum Al Yahave. The payment of Hulin Tameim is a fine compensation. It's a full fledged compensation when given to the Kohen. It becomes property, it becomes a uh, possession of uh, produce owned by the coin. The Mekadish Bu Koyanisha Tafsulah Kidushi. If the coin were to use the Hulim Tameim that he received and use that as as a monetary equivalent in marrying a woman, he would offer that as marriage to a woman. He would add and offer a uh, a basket full of of uh, apples or of uh, of uh, grain that was uh, hulin to man offered to him as compensation he would offer this to the woman as marriage money she becomes his wife that's tofsu la kiddushi she be- the kiddushin takes hold the omer rabbonon ein tashlumov tashlumen and the rabbonon come along and said no it's not payment not, not payment it doesn't belong to the kayin and, and that which he gave to the woman wasn't his to give to her. 
and she's not really married. And by declaring it as non tashlumen you're declaring in effect that everything that happened henceforth was of no consequence, that the marriage is not a marriage, and she can marry someone else. But on a Torah level, she is considered married to this Kohen. So the rabbis are coming along and undoing her marriage thereby, in effect, releasing or freeing a married woman to marry someone else. But she's married. And yet, you see, that happens. So that you see that the rabbis have the power to come and oikir dover mena Torah. This is Rav Chizda's point to Rabba. The Gemara continues. Rabba responds. He says, that doesn't prove anything. My ain't tashlum of tashlum and dekoma Rebbe Meir. What was meant by Rebbe Meir when he said that the payment is not a payment? The boy l'mahadr shlumi chulin tahorin. It doesn't mean that it doesn't belong to the Kayin. It does belong to the Kayin. All that it means is that the Yisrael has to pay again. He has to pay chulin tahorin. The Gemara asks, "I hachi sumchus hainu rabbanon." If that be the case, then that which Sum was quoted in the name of the of Rebbe Meir is the same as that which the Rabbanon said. The Rabbanon said that if it was paid, uh, whether it's paid b'shogi or mezid, you have to compensate again. And now you're saying that that's all Rebbe Meir was saying that you have to compensate again. What's the difference? And if the two appear, if Sumchus appears along with the Chachamim in the same source, they must be saying something different. Omar Rav Acho Bre de Rav Ika. Now here you'll have a after. Uh, Rav Chistos, let's say, opposition to uh, Ra- to Rabo's explanation of the source. So now Rabo's uh, a response on behalf of Rabo, and that's Rav Acha says there is a point of difference. Konsu shoigeg otu mezid ika binayu. Let us say chulin tameim was used to compensate for the consumption of the truma Torah, and it was the chulin tameim was paid. Uh, unintentionally, it was unwitting, a, an unwitting compensation. He didn't realize that it was uh, chulim uh, tameim, or he didn't know there was something wrong with that, and he did it b'shoigeg. Do we expect of him to compensate again? So that will be the point of difference. According to Rabbi Meir, the, the payment done b'shoigeg is fine, and you don't have to pay again. According to the Chomim, we don't want you to get away with it, even though it was done b'shogeg in anticipation of someone who would do it b'mezid. So just like when someone does it b'mezid, someone does it intentionally, he has to pay again, and everyone agrees with that. Uh, if, even if you do it b'shogeg, even if it was done unintentionally, we want you to pay again as well. That's the opinion of the Chomim. Not so, Rebbe Meir. Toshma. Here we go with a, a fourth attempt on the part of Rechista to make his point that it's, it's a given that the Chachomim have the power to uproot things in the Torah. And hence, what I explained, I, Rav Chistan, the Peites, explained that the Hafroshas, uh, the Truma Tamea, uh, to exempt the Torah, lo of Loklum, that even that which was separated is nothing, is quite within the bounds of accepted halachic rulings. And we see that here. Toshma dam shinitma vezorka b'shoge hurza b'mezid lo hurza. Sacrificial blood that became uh, tome, and it was uh, sprinkled on the altar. Uh, if it was unintentional, so hurza. Hurza means the sacrifice is accepted. If it was done intentionally, it's not acceptable. Ve'ach dimidoraiso artsui meratze. On a, here we have a case where on a Torah level, even if the blood was tummy and it was intentionally sprinkled, it's acceptable. Artsum Ratsa means the carbon is acceptable. The Sanya, the, in this Tanaic source, we, we give you the background to that acceptably. Just skip the source for a moment and go to the end after the frame. The Amni Rabbonan Lo And the Rabbonan say, no, it's not acceptable. And then the owner, being told that his sacrifice was unacceptable, is going to bring another carbon, another sacrifice that from the Torah's standpoint he's not expected to bring. From the Torah's perspective, it's holin. It's mundane. 
and he's bringing it into the temple courtyard as, a, as an offering. That's not allowed. And yet, we're saying to do that. So you see from here that the Torah, that the Rabbonin, that the Basin can be master, can make conditions to their rulings and in effect undo something in the Torah. So now, we had said, we're just going back over the source that we did not read, we have said that from a Torah perspective, Dam, that became Tomei, no matter what the circumstances are, when it's used as, uh, as, as uh, the sprinkling for the offering of a sacrifice, that's fine. It's an acceptable sacrifice. And how do you know that? Where do we know that from? Desanya, the source says as follows. Almahat sits Meratze, the tzitz is the golden head plate worn by the Kohen Gadol. <clears throat> it has uh, atonement powers. And what does it atone for? Al Hadam, Val Abosr, Val Chelev, Shenitma. Dam is blood, Bosr is meat, Chelev are the, the fats of sacrifices that are to be offered in uh, every sacrifice that's offered. When, the, when these elements become, became defiled, Shenitma, and we dashed under the line. It's the focus of our discussion right now is on the fact that it was defiled. Bein b'shogeg, bein b'mezid, bein b'oynes, bein b'rotsen, bein b'yochad, bein b'tzibor. Whether it's unwitting, whether it's intentional, whether it's beyond their control, whether it's willing, whether it's private, uh, private sacrifice or a public sacrifice. In all cases, these elements, uh, um, including the blood that became Tomei, it is an acceptable offering. The Amri Rabbonin, the Rabbonin come along and say, Lo Hurza. It's not acceptable. That means the essential part of the sacrifice to, to make it effective, namely the blood offering, the blood sprinkling, is not acceptable. And what's the owner going to have to do? He's going to he's gonna have to bring another sacrifice. Does the, on a Torah level, does, does he have to bring that? No. The Kohadar Mayo Chulin Lazar. And then he's going to be, Mayo means to bring in Chulin, that which is really not sanctified, into the Azora and being offered as a sacrifice. That is forbidden. So Rav Chisto makes his point that Yesh Koyach Lachachomim Lakor Dovor Min HaTorah. They are. How is how is that manifest here? By bringing into the to the to the temple courtyard and offered as a sacrifice something that the Torah does not want you to do. Oma Rab Yosi Bar Chanina, so Rabo the, in in defense of Rabo's position. So you see, Rav Yosi Bar Chanina says, "My lo hurtsu the Kamar, the uh, original source that said b'meizid lo hurtsa." What does that mean? Lahatir bosor bachila. It prevents the meat from being allowed to be eaten. Sacrificial meat is eaten sometimes by uh, by the owners, sometimes only by koyhanim. But in order for it to be eaten, the blood has to be sprinkled. But since you're dealing with a, a, uh, an intentional sprinkling of tomei blood, so we say you cannot eat from the meat. But as far as the original fear, uh, avol, the Gemara goes on, avol, bailim niskapru bo. But the owner does achieve his atonement that was uh, effectuated through the offering of that particular sacrifice hence he's not going to bring an additional sacrifice, there's no problem of Hulin Lazora arising here ah, sof sof but here, here the position taken by Rav Chista comes back comes back into play there still is an example of an uprooting taking place Sof sof komis akro achilas bosor. Here we've dashed underline komis akro. The uprooting. That's the key word here. You do see an uprooting, namely the eating of the sacrificial meat. Uksiv achlu oisom asher kupar bohem. The pasuk expects the eating of the sacrificial meat. Malami. This pasuk teaches us shakainim oichlu mubaylem miskaprim through the eating of the meat on the part of the kehanim, the owner achieves his full atonement. So what do we see here? The rabbis are coming in and saying, don't do that which the Torah says you are to do. The Torah says, eat the meat. The rabbis are moving in saying, don't eat the meat. Is that not an uprooting of the Torah? Omar le comes, the rabbi position is, is now defended. Shei v'altas is 
the case of an uprooting but through passive behavior, that is different. So, Rabo at this point is saying, my objection is where the rabbis move in in a proactive fashion uprooting something in the Torah. Taking something, for example, like truma and, and saying, this is not truma anymore, it's chulin, that's proactive. That's an akira, mamish. The Torah telling you to eat meat and the rabbis saying, don't eat it, that's not proactive, that's passive. They're simply telling you to desist from a certain action. That is not something that I was bothered by in the first place. What I was bothered by, says Rabba to Rav is the uh, initiative taken by the Rabbonin in a proactive manner to uproot something from the Torah. We continue at the top of Omid Beis. Rav comments. Now, we don't have this marked... Uh, with a uh, with a triangle because it's not a it's not in effect a, a question and an answer per se it's Rav Chista observing Omar Le Rav Chista says boy the Oisoyvach I had in mind he said Rav Chista says to Rabo I had in mind <coughs> to challenge you from several different topics. And the Gemara lists off the topics and Rashi elaborates on the topics. The case of Orel, Hazor, Izemel, Sodin Betzitzis, the Kivse Aseres, the Shoifer Velulov. Rashi, as I say, goes through all of the examples. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them. We'll just, we're going to cite uh, one or two of these examples. The case of Shofar, for example, and Lulav. These are mitzvot that when Shabbos coincides with the first day of Rosh Hashanah or the first day of Sukkot, uh, one is expected to blow the Shofar and to pick up a Lulav. <clears throat> the Rabbonon came in and said, don't do it. Why not? Because if you're if, if you're going to if you're going to perform the mitzvah of shofar blowing the shofar on Shabbos, or you're going to pick up a lulav on Shabbos in order to be able to say the mitzvah, you might come. You might come. This is a rabbinic gzera. You might come to carry them in a public domain uh, for Amos, and that is uh, also to do from the Torah. So we, the rabbis, are telling you to desist from the mitzvah of shofar and lulav even though the Torah expects you to do it, but we're telling you, sit and be passive. Don't do it. So, Rav Chisa said, initially, I was going to cite these and the other things mentioned as uh, examples of where the rabbis move in and uproot something from the Torah. But, hashta dishon islon shevi altase lo me'akerhu. Now that you're telling me that what the rabbis... Um, Intervention in a passive fashion, where they tell you to desist from doing something, is not called uprooting. Kulunami, all of these cases that, as we said, are elaborated upon in Rashi, if you want to see all of the different cases, so by all means, look into Rashi. All of those represent cases of shave the altas and inhu. They are, albeit uprooting of the Torah, but in a desist fashion, in a passive fashion where the rabbis are saying simply remain passive and with that uh, attitude so I'm not even going I'm not going to raise these as proofs to the idea of the Chachamim having power to uproot because obviously what you Rabba are concerned with is where the rabbis move in in a proactive fashion telling you to do something uh, against the Torah or declaring, in our case, declaring something that is truma and in a positive fashion declaring it non-truma, declaring it chulin. Nevertheless, we continue. Toshma. Here we have a posuk that uh, is quoted quite briefly, a love tishmun. This deals with a prophet who is a uh, known, honor, uh, honorable, uh, true prophet. Uh, that's P R O P H E T. 
Afinu Omer Loch Avor Al Achas Mikol Mitzvus Shabbatura. Even if he tells you to violate one of the Torah laws, Kigon Elioba Ar Carmel Hakol of Fisha Shmalo. If he tells you to violate a Torah mitzvah on a momentary basis, that means a Fisha, not as a not as not declaring permanently something not applicable, but momentarily. <clears throat> and the example cited is the story involving the prophet Elio, uh, Elijah the prophet on Mount Carmel where he confronted the false prophets of the idol Baal and in, in, in that confrontation a sacrifice was offered to the Almighty outside the Beis HaMikdash that's called Shrute Chutz that's something that is generally speaking strictly forbidden but Elio came along and offered it, that's proactive a proactive uprooting of something from the Torah so here you see that the sages do have such a power to in a proactive fashion uproot something from the Torah Rabo responds Shaini Hasam that is different Dechtif Eilov Tishmon there you have a scriptural uh, um, license for that taking place. So it's not, you're not uprooting from the Torah. The Torah itself is saying, listen to him, listen to the prophet. Well, if the Torah is saying, then listen to him. So now, the Rav Chista position argues, the Ligmar Minei, why not, why not learn from it? Let that be the precedent. That there is a Koyach in, of the Chachomim to Oiker Bekum in a positive fashion, to uproot something from the Torah. Why can't that be a precedent setter then? So Rabbah will respond, Migdar Milsa Shiny. Where, uh, the, where the, the case of Elio Anovi cannot serve as a precedent. It was a result of extenuating circumstances that demanded a, an action, though against the Torah, in order to defend the Almighty and the Torah. That's Migdar from the word Goder. Migdar is to build a fence. When it's an extenuating circumstances in order to defend an otherwise uh, emergency situation, then and only then are we allowing for that to happen. But to be a precedent setter across the boards, granting power to the sages of uprooting in a proactive fashion all kinds of things in the Torah, that no one ever said. Toshma. So again, Rav Chisda comes back with an attempt to show that we do uproot things from the Torah. This source deals with the realm of divorce. A husband sends a divorce document through an agent to his wife. And in this source we then see the husband annulling the get, declaring it void. So the source says, Bitlo mevutal. If the husband who sent the divorce document subsequently declares it void, it is void. And uh, the woman who receives it, his wife that receives it, really is not in they, uh, entitled to marry another man. Rabbi Shimon Leal says a husband cannot annul. He cannot void again. He cannot add to conditions that were stipulated in the divorce document. Because if he were to be able to do that, where would, where would we be able to appreciate the strength of the law of the courts? In other words, the rabbis said that a husband is not to annul a get. Once he sends a get, he is not to annul it. Now, that's very nice as far as the rabbis are concerned. They said not to do so. From a Torah perspective, is the get annulled? Yes. From a Torah perspective, a husband has the power before, uh, has the power to annul a get. Certainly before it receives her hands, if a husband annuls it, it is annulled. The Gemara says, get." From the Torah perspective, the divorce document is in fact voided. 
And because of our concern to preserve the authority of the rabbis, we are declaring the the annulment to be non-binding. By saying the annulment is non-binding, the woman receives this get, and she is viewed as divorced. Now on a Torah level, is she divorced? No. Because the husband annulled it. But in order to preserve rabbinic authority that said, don't do such things, so we say that the woman is divorced. The kind, and what? Here's a woman that from the Torah perspective is still married. The husband annulled the get. And we're saying no, she's considered divorced and we're allowing an Ashish, a married woman to marry someone else. A major Torah violation. So what are we then demonstrating here? We're demonstrating that the rabbis have the power to, in effect, uproot something from the Torah. To, to present it in simplistic terms, the rabbis are taking a woman that is married and declaring her unmarried and sending her off, so to speak, to marry some other man while she's still married from the Torah. That's a tremendous example of uprooting something in a proactive fashion. So, Rav is making his point here. He's, he's telling us, you see this happening. So, how, why do you, why do you, Rabba, challenge my explanation that I offered in the case of the uh, truma, uh, um, the, the tithing of the, from the uh, tome on the Torah? Rabba answers, Man de Mekadesh. When a person enters matrimony, one who marries a woman, he does so conditionally. Conditionally upon what? Upon accepting all the laws involving matrimony. And matrimony includes the laws of divorce. He does so, when a person enters marriage, he does so accepting upon himself that everything he does is in accordance with the laws of the rabbis. Now, if a person steps out of bounds, so then we say you were never really married. Because your initial marriage was through accepting the rules of the rabbis. So, Vafkinu, Rabbonan, the Kiddushin means they, the rabbis uproot it's a type of, let's say, retroactive declaration that you were never married so that the woman that we're allowing now to marry someone else is in effect the woman that was never married to you in the first place. Omer le Ravino le Ravashi Hotenach de Kodesh Bekaspa This analysis of the rabbis coming to uproot something that's an analysis where the original marriage the original Kiddushin was done through money. Practically speaking, what are we saying? That you married a woman by giving her money. Okay, so in, in, in actuality, money was transferred from the man to the woman. However, we discover later that <laughs> this husband stepped out of bounds. He voided the get he, uh, after it was sent through the agent. We said that's a violation of the, of the rabbi's teachings. And therefore, you were never married. And what about the money? Ah, the money that you gave her. That was not marriage money. It a, was a gift of money that you gave her. That's Hafkwa's Kiddushin. That's the, we're uprooting because of his stepping out of bounds. We're uprooting the initial marriage and the money that was de- de- given, we declare as all that money initially was a gift. It wasn't marriage money. So she was never married. It's like giving uh, your neighbor a, a gift of money uh, be, uh, on, on your neighbor's birthday. There's no legal significance. So that's fine if the initial marriage was done through Kesef, one of the three different means of establishing a marriage. The first Mishnah in Maseches Kiddushin says, Oisha Nikneis Bekesef Bishtar Kesef is one of them. One of the other methods of, of uh, initiating a marriage is through intimacy. Kodesh Bebiya Mai Ika Lameimar How are you going to explain that case where the 
uh, initial marriage was done through intimacy. What are you you're going to say it didn't take place? But it did take place. You can't, how do you how do you like, redefine intimacy? And yet you see that that we are declaring something that objectively is a marriage as a as a uh, non marriage, and that would be in effect not not because you you know you stepped out of bounds and were therefore uh, redefining things. How do you redefine? How do you redefine int- intimacy? Ella, what? So, so this is a a, a, a position taken by by Rav Chista in uh, against Rabba. Uh, Rabba's explanation of the uh, the Afkin Rabban and the Kedushin. How are you going to apply that to the case of Bia? So Rabba answers, yes, I can do that here. Shavuha Rabban and Lebilasa Bilaznus. The Rabbanan, in fact, redefine his initial act that he thought he was doing as an act of intimacy for marriage purposes as an act of harlotry. So at this point, we don't see an example of the rabbis uprooting something. As far as the case with the Bithul Haget, nothing was uprooted. It's simply that the original marriage never took place. And as such, you don't have an example of a married woman being declared free to marry someone else. She was never married. Toshma. And here, again, we have another attempt on the part of Rav Chista to show that we, we do uproot things. Um, uh, we have a Tanaic source. This is our seventh uh, attempt on the part of uh, Rav Chista to bring a source to bolster his position. Omer Rabbi Lozer ben Yankov. Shomati shebeistin makin voinshin shalom in Torah. Rabbi Lozer ben Yankov says, I heard that the courts have the power to makin is to hit, to, uh, to uh, apply lashings and punishments, even if it's not in accordance with strict uh, Torah guidelines. Not with the intention of violating the Torah, but rather with an intention of strengthening, creating a fence in protection of the Torah. So we have we have a uh, a double underline to highlight uh, two cases where we see this kind of. Um, uh, intervention on the part of the courts. There was an incident with, a, with an Odom Echad Sherochav al Sus Bishabbos Bimei Avonim. He uh, was riding a horse on Shabbos. Now, the riding of a horse on Shabbos from a strictly Torah perspective is, is okay. It's not a malocha. It's not considered a constructive activity, one of the 39 different malochas that the Torah prohibits. Riding a horse is also on a purely rabbinic level. The fear that if you ride a horse, you might come to break off a branch to serve as a whip for the horse. Now, breaking off the branch with that intention would be a Torah violation, but here he hasn't done it. He's just alighting a horse. He's, 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 riding, he's uh, riding upon a horse. What's, what's wrong with that? Nothing from the Torah perspective. And yet, we find a person that was riding horse on Shabbos during the Greek period. The Greek period was characteristic of, uh, of the uh, characteristics of the Greek period were many Jews that became Hellenists. They uh, basically abandoned uh, the Torah and its teachings in favor of uh, of uh, Greek culture, society, and practice. So you have a person behaving like this in those days. They have Eula based in. They brought him to the court, the Sakluhu, and they stoned him to death. Not because he was deserving of that. It was those times that demanded this ex- uh, 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 exceptional uh, behavior on the part of the court. You can see the Rashi uh, toward the end of the column, the Rashi commentary, the last line he says, It was a time of trouble and the, uh, the Jewish society was characterized by, by massive sinning. So because of mass sinning and mass uh, degradation of the Torah, the court uh, 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 is provided, the court is provided with the power to take such 
uh, extensive uh, uh, action in order to make the point that there is a Torah and there is Shulchan Aruch and there is Halacha that Jews are bound by. Veshuv Mais, another incident. It was a man that behaved promiscuously, although with his wife. What did he do? He had intimacy, conducted his uh, intimacy with his wife under a, under a uh, fig tree, which for our purposes would mean uh, an act of intimacy uh, which demands true uh, uh, modesty, and he did it in public. They viewed the base in the Hilkuhu, and they brought him to court and lashed him. There's no punishment of lashings for uh, having intimacy with your wife, even if it happened to be, happens to be in public. The, the act itself is allowed. You're, it's a man with his, with, his, uh, with his wife, with his legally uh, acceptable spouse. So the act of intimacy per se is not problematic. It's just where it was done, under what kind of surrounding circumstances. So that doesn't... It's true there's a, a violation of modesty, but that doesn't um, uh, introduce a, a penalty of lashing. So why was he lashed? Again, as we said before, it was a, a societal problem. It was a society characteristic of mass immodesty. And in order to, counter, to counterbalance that mass immodesty, uh, this was necessary. So, what do you see from here? You see now, you're not allowed to kill someone, you're not supposed to be killed in a certain, and, and, and not even allowed to hit someone that's not allowed to be lashed, and yet we're, we are killing, and we are lashing. Say, a, a proactive uprooting of the Torah on the part of the courts. So, Rav Christo is making his point, and Rabo responds, Migdar Milsa Shiny. We saw this answer before when we saw the case of Elio Bahar Carmel introduced there were extenuating uh, momentary circumstances that demanded the intervention in order to preserve the Torah so we have a concept of, of a momentary uprooting of the Torah in order to preserve the larger picture Torah observance in general and as we said before, as far as Rabba is concerned, that is not an example of something that bothers me. But now, in the superstructure of the Gemara, we have to relate back to our previous Shira as well, the Gemara from Dav Tes, where we saw Rav Kista, uh, who was represented in this particular sukya by the inverted triangle, Rav Kista had declared the... Uh, the uh, tithing from the defiled on the pure as being... Uh, uh, ineffective altogether where even the tithe is a non-tithe and the rabbis thereby declare something that the Torah would recognize as truma as being non-truma that's a proactive uprooting of something from the Torah and this was this was something that upset in other words Rav Chisto's interpretation of that Tanaic source upset Rabo and you notice the last triangle in this whole give and take is a triangle with its point facing up, leaving us with Rabba's position presented as, we'll say, the last word. And in, in, in effect, then, he, he remains, we'll say, with his discomfort with Rav Chistah's interpretation that you saw back on Peites Amad Aleph. Uh, the uh, the alternative interpretation that of Rav Nosson Barboshia would probably be the the route that Rabba would take in explaining the Tanaic source back there on in the middle of Pei Tesomet Aleph. We continue with the Gemara. Velo zevazem etamin law. We spoke about our the uh, the woman who uh, remarried based on the testimony of one witness, and the husband then came back. She has to leave both husbands. Uh, and neither one, if they happen to be Kohanim, no, neither one are allowed to defile themselves in in her uh, burial. Minola, from where do we know this? So the Gemara answers. The answer takes a few lines to develop. A long answer. Dechtiv, you have a posuk in the context of Kohanim. It says, "Kiim l'she'eroi hakorov elov." A Kohen is entitled or is expected to defile himself l'she'ero. Uh, in the Omar more and the more continues by saying Shero zu ishto. The word Shero means one's wife. Very simply stated, a Kohen is metame to his wife. 
uksiv lo yitame baal bamov lehechalo. There's another pasuk that says a person, a kohen, is not entitled to defile himself uh, uh, to his dead wife. So we have what would seem to be a contradiction in psukim. The resolution is as follows: Yesh baal shemitame v'yesh baal sheim mitame. There are cases of a husband defiling himself, and there are cases where he is not to defile himself. How is that to be understood? He is entitled to defile himself to a woman that is acceptable to him. But he cannot metame himself. He is a Kohen. He can't be metame to defile himself to a woman that he is not allowed to be with. And in our situation, you have a uh, woman that is not allowed to be with husband number two. She was an ashes ish with him, and uh, it's quite uh, and, and technically speaking, uh, she uh, she's uh, or legally speaking, she's not allowed to be with husband number one either, because you have a case of a woman, a married woman, who willingly had uh, intimacy with a second man. Uh, neither husband is entitled to benefit from articles that she finds. Uh, in general, a woman, a married woman that finds articles, it belongs to her husband. In general, why was it ruled that the uh, found articles of married women go to their husbands? Kihechi the lo teheve le eva. So that there shouldn't be a sense of, of enmity between husband and wife. After all, a husband is obligated to support his wife. So he's, he's on the giving end. And uh, we uh, made a, a point extensively in our previous year. So those of you who are, uh, who are familiar with uh, our uh, discourse at the end of our previous year concerning the centrality of money in the eyes of the Talmud regarding the human psyche can all the more appreciate this a man is always giving he's giving mizonos he's supporting his wife giving, giving, giving if, uh, if, a, if a person is left in that position always giving and never receiving that, is, uh, that creates fertile ground for evil, for enmity so in order to avoid that and, and rather to create a, an environment of of uh, conviviality, of harmony, we say, look, lady, you are getting from your husband support. Give to your husband in return articles that you find. So that's in order to create harmony, to preserve the marriage. However, over here, where you have an uh, illegal marriage, let there be enmity and more enmity. And, and, and we'll certainly accomplish that by having this, these, these husbands uh, seeing uh, the, the woman, the, the wife, keeping the found articles. Neither uh, husband are entitled to benefit from uh, uh, income that she produces. Why is it that women, married women in general, married women are to give their income to their husbands? Because she is benefiting from his support. In this case, since he is not supporting her, remember, we're talking about a marriage that's unacceptable, Maise yodeha lav dide, so her profit is not to be given to him. If, if, if after all the, the woman's profits were given to the husband in exchange for her being supported by the husband, well, he's not supporting her, so her profits don't go to him. Velo mefer nidoreha. One of the characteristics of a husband wife relationship is that a husband has the rights to void her vows. That's a Torah uh, provided for right that a husband has. If a husband hears uh, on the uh, her, hears his uh, wife making a vow, on the, and on the same day he decides to void it, to annul it, he can do that. Taimo my Omer Rachmona Balmefer. Why is it that the Torah uh, ex- the Torah provides for that? 
that a, that a husband annuls his wife's vows. And when, by the way, when we speak about a husband annulling his wife's vows, it applies to certain kinds of vows. Uh, amongst those vows would be, imagine a woman takes a vow that she is not going to bathe anymore, or she is not going to use uh, cosmetics anymore. Well, a husband who hears that, he's going to end up with, a, end up with an ugly wife. So we say that the, the Torah allows him to annul, to be made for her nidorim. So why is that? So that she should not become abhorrent in his eyes. We want them, we want to preserve the, uh, the married couple. Aha, but in our case, where the marriage is illicit, let her become abhorrent and all the more so. So that if she vows not to bathe, we'll be very happy with that vow remaining and, of course, pre- preventing the husband from annulling that so that he'll want to get rid of her. He'll want to separate from her. The uh, woman uh, that had been married in our story uh, heard that her husband died because of the testimony of one witness. She then went ahead and married another man, and the husband came back. You have a woman that was a basically a, a married woman living with another man. So that uh, that disqualifies her from uh, ever marrying a Kohen in the future. The Gemara at the top of Tzadi Aleph Omer Aleph says, Pshita, well, of course she's disqualified. She, Rashi points out, Zona, he, she is a Zona. She is what, we, what the Torah classifies as a Zona, one of the types of women that are uh, prohibited to the Kuna. A divorcee is prohibited, and a Zona is prohibited. A woman who experienced forbidden intimacy uh, at, the, at, the, at the Kores level, she is prohibited to a Kohen. And we said at the, uh, 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 we said to the Korais level that makes her into a zona. The Gemara says, you know, you're right that to uh, this this point of uh, her being disqualified from the Huna is is really obvious. So why is it in the Mishnah? Baslevi min amaiser it's the richale. The Mishnah really was was had an agenda of getting to the next level to describe a daughter of a co- of a levi. Levium, Levium are people that are uh, 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 entitled to the Meiser Rishon tithe. One of the several tithes that are separated from produce and the Meiser Rishon is given to Levium. Uh, the Levi family, including the women in the family, eat from that, the Meiser Rishon. So if you have a Bas Levi that uh, is the subject of our story of the woman who married a second husband, well, she, our mission says, becomes disqualified from the Meiser, and that is a novel point. The Gemara asks, it, not only is it novel, is it even correct? Does a Bas Levi become prohibited from uh, Meiser because of illicit relations? A woman from a Levi family that was captured, and when a woman is captured, we suspect that she had intimacy with non-Jews, with the captors, or she was involved in intimacy, uh, uh, other, other forbidden forms of intimacy, uh, like with, uh, with, we said, Gentiles, with, with uh, slaves, uh, and it says in the source, Nursula Meiser, because we give her, nevertheless, we give her Meiser, and she eats from that. So what is the uh, Mishnah telling me that this uh, married woman who uh, entered marriage with a second man becomes disqualified from the Miser? By letter of the law, she's entitled to it. So Amar Rav Sheshis, Knossa Rav Sheshis says it's a, a fine that we impose upon her. The Mishnah also taught Bas Kohen Minatruma. If she was the daughter of a Kohen, she becomes disqualified from eating Truma. And what the uh, Gemara points out is the Chiddush of the Mishnah is Afilu Betruma de Rabbonan. Even from Rabbinic type Truma. Rashi explains, as far as Torah level Truma, that I don't need to teach you. We saw that she loses out in Miser, certainly she'll lose out in Truma, which is a more 
uh, uh, severe uh, area of tithing. But even rabbinic required Shuma, this woman who was a uh, Bas Kohen it will, will uh, um, lose out on, will be deprived from that. 